So I'm going to start off and I'm going to talk a little bit about GAO, just to sort of give you some context of who we are and what we do and how we're different from some of the other congressional support agencies. We work directly for the Congress and we do studies either at their request or at their direction for a wide range of healthcare issues. And the healthcare team has about 200 members and we do work on Medicare, Medicaid, uh, CHIP, long-term care, private health insurance, health reform, some on workforce, um, a lot of work in public health, um, work on care for people who are in the care of the Defense Department and also the VA. So we have sort of do a broad, a broad swath of things, but always sort of at the direction or the request of Congress. And because there is too much demand for our work, we are generally able only to do work for either the chairs or the ranking members of the committees that have jurisdiction over the specific issues. We do a lot of original work. We have a legal right of access to, to data from government agencies and from agencies that are under contract or firms that are under contract to the government. So that gives us um, a unique view into things. And we also, um, spend a lot of time talking to government agencies. We do all of our work according to government auditing standards. All of our work is transparent. It's all in the public sector. So it's, it's all published. So that's a little bit about who we are and what we do. I'm going to talk about money too. And I'm going to try and put some context into the GME discussion that, that Mark just had with you. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about our current and our past work on uh, federal health care workforce education and training programs. And uh, I'm going to go off script a little bit <laughs> right at the beginning to sort of follow up on something uh, that Mark said because a, a couple of years ago we were asked to do some work after the, um, the health care workforce commission that was funded in the Affordable Care Act was not um, given appropriations and there was sort of a vacuum of work there. We were asked to do some work on the federal health care workforce and so we set out to do something that would compare the different models of workforce projections. Um, but ultimately we weren't able to do it because we wanted to look at models that HRSA has created and also models that were done by other organizations. But at that point, HRSA was pretty far behind on publishing its reports and, um, it, it, you know, they weren't published. So we published a report that said HRSA should publish its reports and it should also uh, publish a schedule of when they're going to publish their other reports. And uh, I'm pleased to say that shortly after that, they did publish their primary care report and have been on track with, with other reports. So that, we think, was one outcome um, of our work. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about federal funding for health workforce programs, and I'm going to put this GME funding, I hope, in context of all other federal spending. And I want to say that we're talking here about just uh, post-secondary education for direct health care professionals. So we're not talking about people who are um, community health people. It's just direct people who are providing direct health care services. And the, the, this funding includes instructions, degree programs, on-the-job clinical training, GME, uh, financial assistance for health professions, students or professionals, and continuing education. And sort of as a corollary to the work that we did on the models, we were asked to do an inventory of all federal spending on healthcare programs because no one really knew in any sort of consolidated way what the federal government was spending in total on health on healthcare workforce issues. So in fiscal year 2012, there were four federal departments that funded 91 programs that supported direct health care workforce. And those departments are, not surprisingly, HHS, the Department of Veterans Affairs, the Department of Defense, and the Department of Education. 
Okay, so we're going to look here. You can see on this slide here that, you know, you hear a lot about the 800-pound gorilla, but, you know, GME is way more than that in this equation. And you can see that of all the federal funding for healthcare workforce, 78% of it comes in the form of GME. Some of that is direct medical education for Medicare pays for. Some of it is indirect. Some of it is Medicaid. And there's other funding for, for GME that goes to health centers. And then this little wedge here, the 22%, is all the other 84 programs that constitute $3.2 billion. So when you think about that, think about, you know, what's really driving workforce is, is Medicare and GME. Okay. So in fiscal year 2012, which is when our work, the year that we did our work, HHS obligated 11.7 for 69 programs that supported direct health for workforce education. And so the majority, I've already said this, went for graduate medical education and other groups that, that train physicians. And VA and DOD also fund GME programs of their own. They also train physicians, and they spend about $660 million that year. So now I'm going to shift gears, and I'm going to talk about the other 22%, all of those programs. And we looked at them, and we sort of divided them into four different categories. One that trained physicians directly, one that trained non-physician professionals. There are programs that address geographic shortages, and there are also programs that promote workforce diversity. So training physicians includes 18 total programs, including obviously the GME, health center residencies. There are programs that support residencies uh, in health centers. I'll talk a little bit more about this. And I'm just going to give you some example because we would be here all day and probably into tomorrow if we were to talk about all of the programs. But if you're really interested in those programs, you can look at our report, okay? So here are just examples of training physicians. There's the Children's Hospital GME program. That's $256 million. There's about $39 million that goes to primary care training and enhancement. And their grants to improve the quality, quantity, and the distribution of the primary care workforce. There's about $30 million that goes into autism training, and that's grants to public and private nonprofit institutions to provide training to health professionals on skills related to autism and other developmental disabilities. And then there's a teaching health centers GME program that gets about $17.2 million. So these are just some examples of the programs that train physicians. Okay, switching to non-physician professionals, there are 27 programs that address the following. Nursing, physician's assistant, and others, and dentists. And here are some examples of those programs. There's the Health Professions Opportunity Grants, and they provide, provides about $80 million to provide education and training to uh, people who receive temporary assistance to needy families to train them in healthcare programs where there's a shortage or there's a high paying demand, you know, a demand for that. There are Medicare payments for nursing and allied health education. And when you think about allied health education, you want to think about optometrists, nutrition, uh, all the therapists, the physical therapists, the OTs. Um, and there's about $273 million in that. There are also grants to provide for uh, advanced nursing education. And these are people like nurse midwives, nurse, nurse practitioners. And then there's about $20 million in training um, for public health dentistry. And these are, just, these are just like illustrations of these other programs, okay? So th that's sort of a snapshot of what we have in non-physician professionals. Then there are programs to address geographic shortages in the different kinds of health professionals. And that includes nine total programs. 
and there are programs serving health professions shortage areas, areas and those are areas, these are designations made by HRSA that have certain kinds of shortages in types, specific types of healthcare professionals, mostly focusing on primary care, but also focusing on dental issues and some other issues. And then there are also medically underserved areas called MUAs or MUPs, medically underserved populations. And there are programs that are targeted to serving areas where there is a lack of health care, of health care services. So the HIPSA is really looking at the shortages of different types of professionals, and the MUAs is looking at areas where there are not necessarily um, shortages of physicians or other caregivers, but where there's a lack of access to health care. And those things sort of key off um, poverty levels and other measures like that. Okay, you've probably heard about the National Health Service Corps. And in that program, they provide training, uh, loans, and scholarships for people who agree to serve in HIPSA uh, after they're finished. So here are some examples of those programs. There's the loan repayment program, the National Health Service loan repayment, much bigger than the scholarship program. That's $221 million, and the scholarship program, $53 million. There are also grants called, they're called AHECs, grants to medical and nursing schools to maintain area health education centers, and there are loan repayment programs for, of about $30 million to train health professions to serve in uh, Indian Health Service or tribal areas. So those are geographic shortage issues. And then there are also programs to promote workforce diversity. And here are some examples of those. There are um, health professions uh, scholarships for, for Indians or Native Americans. There's minority health fellowship programs, and there's scholarships for disadvantaged students and centers of excellence to increase health professions opportunities for underrepresented minority students and faculty. So that's examples of workforce diversity. And then there's some other programs, well, you know, not going to talk about in great detail because it's just too much detail, but we will say, I do want to say, like, the smallest of these programs is about um, a half a million dollars of all of these programs that we're talking about, and then up to the, the GME. So you see where that, so you see where that is. And then I want to talk a little bit about the other departments that provide training, and you can see here that the VA has about 12 programs, and they spent about $1.7 billion, so this is not Medicare money, this is VA, and then the DOD spent almost a billion dollars in, in FY12, but when they reported to us, these are really only the administrative cost of their GME programs, not the direct cost of it. They weren't able to report it to us in that way. And then the Department of Education has a couple million dollars in this arena. So that's sort of the broad overview of what's going on in federal health force programs. There were a lot of changes made in the Affordable Care Act, including, as, as Aaron mentioned, and I think Mark mentioned too, the creation of the Workforce Commission that never got started, but there were also expansions and uh, increases in appropriations to all of these other programs. But still, by far, Medicare, is the dominant player with direct and indirect medical education programs, okay? I told you a little bit about at the beginning about our work a few years ago, look, trying to look at the modeling for different types of health professions and why we weren't able to do it. And as a follow-on to that, we were asked to sort of go back and um, look at HHS more broadly and to look and see at the department level, because they are the major player, for health professions education, what are their, what's in their strategic plan and what are their other efforts for ensuring that the nation's healthcare workforce meets its future demands? What information and what processes does HHS use in this? 
you know, what models do they use? How do they figure out what this is? And I think here's an important question. Are they measuring whether all of these programs over which they have jurisdiction are actually meeting the bigger goal of getting to workforce education? So we are um, in the field now with that work, and one of my colleagues here is here today, Arisha Kumar, who helped me with these slides today, along with another colleague who's not here. And um, we're you know, out actively talking to people about that now, and we should be able to report on this later this year. Okay, and then just this slide will show you in case you want to look at our prior work, but you can go to, um, GAO.gov, our search engine, all of our work is in the public domain, and um, we have a pretty good search engine, and you can pull up these reports and uh, see, you know, more about what we said. But you can also ask us. Feel free to, to call on us and ask us. We'd be happy to talk to you and tell you what we know and, and, you know, as we're going. The one thing we don't do while we're doing our work is we don't talk about our results until they're done. So um, I'm not able to tell you what we think we're going to find in our ongoing work, but, you know, once it's in the public domain, we'll be happy to talk about that. And with that, I'll stop and see if there are questions and turn it back to Judy. Okay.